In this brief video, I want to unbox micro-credentials by looking at some of the underlying drivers and attractors, if you like. In December 2020, the European Commission issued this much anticipated report on a European approach to micro-credentials. I had the privilege to serve on the consultation group that helped to develop the report, including such things as a common definition and terminology, at least for the European context. It wasn't long after that in January 2001, a team of us from the ECIU University produced this white paper on paving the road for the micro-credential movement. This white paper is only one of many reports that have been published over the years on micro-credentials. And it really raises the question, what are the drivers? How come there's such interest in micro-credentials, not just in Europe, but worldwide? If you like, what is the strategic imperative right now for such a focus on micro-credentials? The answer to the question is actually quite complex. There are a number of competing and coexisting drivers, but what I'll try to do is give you a very brief helicopter overview of some of them. Firstly, in 2020, the White House issued this executive order to place a focus on hiring on skills over college degrees. This is not a new um, trend. Actually, major corporates like Google and Microsoft have also shifted their hiring strategies to place a greater focus on skills. The underlying assumption is that the degree does not prepare people for the nature and future of work as maybe it once did. Now, there is some evidence to support this in the literature but probably it would be beneficial for us to have more robust or rigorous evidence to substantiate this claim. I think it would be fair to say that not all universities produce precisely the same types of graduates. So no doubt there are variations. For those already in employment, the World Economic Forum claims that there is an alarming skills gap. In fact, the skills gap is such that by the year 2025, 50% of people already in employment will need to be reskilled or upskilled due to the ongoing nature of digital disruption and the changing nature of work itself. This is really recognized in Europe in the most recent 2020 European skills agenda, where the need to bring upskilling right across Europe for new professions that are emerging, new jobs that are emerging. There's a general appreciation that millions of people are going to be displaced in one form or another due to the changing nature of work. At the same time, there is a recognition that there are new kinds of skills that we need to be focusing on and that micro-credentials might provide us with the opportunity to not only develop them, but also to recognize them in ways that we may not do currently in our forms of certification. We should not overlook at the same time the impact that the MOOC movement has had on the growth of micro-credentials worldwide. Um, in, this, in December 2020, it was estimated that there are over 1,200 different types of micro-credentials available on the major MOOC platforms, from nano degrees to micro-masters and anything in between. There is an argument that um, this is nothing more than, if you like, the uh, commercialization and globalization of higher education. So there are people who critique that the micro-credential movement is actually nothing more than pandering to the forces of neoliberalism, or even at a pedagogical level, nothing more than um, learning innovation theater, to quote um, Rolston. 
Well, in many respects, there are elements of the neoliberal market-driven global forces very much associated with the micro-credentialing movement. As you can see here in Australia, where in 2020, the government announced the intention to develop a marketplace for online micro-credentials to position Australia for the opportunities that might be available in the future. What I would say is that if one accepts um, such sweeping generalizations about micro-credentials, it's the very reason why educators need to be in the driving seat. Moreover, there are other driving forces, and here in Europe in particular, one of those is addressing the need to promote and develop many more lifelong learners for the future. Actually, we are far from meeting the targets that have been set by the European Commission and member states for the number of lifelong learners in each of our countries. We're a long way short of that. And micro-credentials may give us the opportunity to open up new pathways for learning to promote learning to be, learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to transform the kind of pillars of lifelong learning. At the same time, there are people that argue that micro-credentials in a disruptive way can allow us to give us the opportunity, if you like, to embrace new forms of pedagogy, new opportunities to really take advantage of new pedagogies. And in a similar vein, in the post-COVID world, um, the opportunity for us to really harness the potential of new digital learning technologies. How might we exploit their pedagogical affordances aligned with new credentials and new learning pathways? There are also more civic drivers that we should not overlook associated with micro-credentials. I've touched on lifelong learning, but the sustainable development goals spring to mind. And again, here in Europe, a strong emphasis on the, on the new green deal that micro-credentials might allow higher education institutions and also industry partners, which we shouldn't forget, to be much more agile to respond to new and emerging areas of priority. The one thing that I want to finish on, and it sounds a little bit of a slogan, but when we're thinking about micro-credentials, we really need to think not about micro-credentials, but the big ideas that they might be able to help us enable and translate into reality, if you like. So micro-credentials really need to be in the service of big ideas, not as the big idea itself. Some of the underlying drivers and attractors I've covered uh, have interesting ideas associated with them. As I mentioned, they are not necessarily all on the same road or working for the same end. So hopefully that gives you a brief overview of some of the different viewpoints. So hopefully that gives you a nice helicopters overview. So hopefully that gives you a very quick helicopter overview of some of the different change forces at work. And um, we will explore more of these as the course continues. Thank you.